Welcome to the Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we provide you with insights, quotes, references, and help for your Gospel Doctrine class. Welcome back to another episode of Gospel Doctrine Helps class, where we look to help you with your Gospel Doctrine class, and today we are on what I would call New Testament Lesson 17 in the Come Follow Me manual, and it is specifically about John chapter 7 through 10, and the title of the lesson is I Am the Good Shepherd. And to be quite frank with you, I don't think that we can adequately cover the material in one session. I just don't have enough time to go over everything. So what I'm going to do today is I'm just going to cover chapter 7 of John, and we're going to talk about that. I know that probably the more appealing chapters are, you know, 9 and 10 or even 8, but I think John 7 is worth covering. And I think it has some interesting information, and there's some things that we can cover in John 7 that will be very beneficial for your Gospel Doctrine class and for learning. I also want to bring up the fact that if I have some extra time, I will do some supplement material on John chapters 8, 9, and 10. So look for those. If I have time, um, you can definitely search my channel, see if there's anything else out there. So let's start with John chapter 7 um, and just read verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he would not walk in Jewry because the Jews sought to kill him. So this is an important theme in this chapter. And, and it's important because John is trying to point out the fact that the Jews wanted to kill Jesus. And when it says walked in Jewry, it's specifically talking about in Judea or in Jerusalem. Um, and I want to bring out an, uh, something interesting, a, a reference that maybe you haven't considered before. If, um, if you have 1 Nephi chapter 1, pull that out and read verse 20 with me. And I think you'll see a similarity here between Lehi and our Lord. And I think this happens from time to time. Uh, verse 20 of 1 Nephi chapter 1, it says, And when the Jews heard these things, they were angry with him, yea, even as with the prophets of old, whom they had cast out and stoned and slain. And they also sought his life, that they might take it away. Now, I, th I didn't finish reading the whole verse, but that brings up a fact that the Jews tried to kill Lehi as well. Why did they do that? Ask yourself the question, why would they try and kill him? Is one of the reasons they tried to kill him because he's disrupting the citizens. He's um, cry, cry, creating an unrest. Or is it because he's teaching truth and he's teaching them something that affects their craft, meaning their ability to collect money and offerings and profit off of their religion? Were they engaged in priestcraft? That's something that you ought to ask yourself and ought to consider. Now, verse 2 of John chapter 7 gives us some time frame. It says, Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. The Feast of Tabernacles is also called Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T. Now, I have here a book that I typically use um, when I teach the um, church history lessons. And I'm going to bring it up here to show you. It's called Visions and Manifestations and Miracles of the Restoration uh, by Trevin Hatch. And it's a really good book. It brings up some stuff that um, many people haven't thought about before during the Restoration and some ties into George Washington and, and other things like that. But he has a brief explanation. Sukkot was a multiple day holiday. I'm going to read from page 112 of this book um, to bring some context and tie in some things here. It says, as young Joseph knelt and prayed for forgiveness and to receive additional long-awaited revelation on the night of September 21st, 1823. Little did he know that he would remain awake the entire night and be instructed and taught concerning ancient prophecies. He also did not realize that this day, September 21st, 1823, was a holy day to the ancient Israelites, and especially to the Jews during the Second Temple period. This day fell on a two-day, two days of the seven-day Israelite holy day of Sukkot, no, also known as the Feast of the Tabernacle or the Feast of Booths. And he's going to give us a little history. He says, God commanded the Israelites to set aside this time every year for remembering their ancestors who wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, the protection they received, and God's promise to bring them out of the wilderness. He references Leviticus 23, verse 34, and Deuteronomy 16, uh, verse 13. This day also, however, carried a great significance for the restoration of the kingdoms of the last days. And he goes on 
and he adds uh, prophecies from Joel 2:28 and 29, Acts 2, 1 through 8, um, and, and there's some others. So that's a good book if you want to pick that up and learn that. But essentially, the holiday of uh, the Feast of Tabernacles um, was done in remembrance of the children of Israel and the tabernacle, the portable temple that they had while they were traveling in the wilderness. They would also light... Um, uh, they would light fires on the tops of mountains and they would they would go around. And so all of the kingdom of Israel on the mountaintops, there would be these uh, fires being lit each night um, that, that would happen. They also would read scriptures. And uh, during the end of the feast, they would also read uh, some of the Psalms. And I'll talk about that when we get a little bit further down. We'll pull out the uh, Jewish New Testament commentary and talk about that. But to give you an idea, this is a feast. This is a celebration. It's a ritual that happens every year. And so that gives you some time frame, okay? Verse 3, his brethren, therefore, his brethren meaning Jesus' brothers and possibly his sister as well, therefore said unto him, depart hence and go into Judea that thy disciples also may see the works that thou doest. So his brothers um, are encouraging him uh, to go to Jerusalem and to teach them, right? That they can see your works. In other words, perform some miracles. Verse 4, For there is no man that doeth anything in secret, and he, op- and he himself seeketh to be known openly. If thou do these things, show thyself to the world. So what he's basically saying, they're, they are in one sense saying, don't let your don't hide your light under a bushel. Don't do it in secret, but do your good works openly. Um, let everybody know. Verse 5, For neither did his brethren believe him. Now, this is an interesting aside by John. If his brethren didn't believe him and they are encouraging him to go to Jerusalem, why would that be? Would it be perhaps that they wouldn't mind to see him being killed as well? Perhaps on the off chance that they may not have a brother who's so famous? Maybe? I'm not sure. But it says they didn't believe him. Why do you think it was so hard for them to believe uh, may I suggest that because they grew up with him, they knew him more intimately than they knew others. And so perhaps they didn't believe him because they knew him. They were familiar with him. Um, he wasn't some you know person high up uh, that they had, didn't have access to. This was somebody that they knew, that they hung out with. Um, a reference here to look at is Psalm 69, 8. If you've got that, uh, your Old Testament, turn over to that. Psalm 69, 8. And this can give us uh, some additional knowledge there. All right, 69.8 says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children. Think about that psalm, how that is fulfilled in what happened just, just here with his brethren. He's become a stranger to his brethren. It's as if they don't realize who he is because they don't believe him. All right, let's keep moving on. John 7, verse 6. Then Jesus said unto them, meaning his brethren, My time is not yet come, but your time is always ready. What is he talking about here when he says, My time is not yet come? This isn't the only time that Jesus uses this phrase during his ministry, My time is not yet come. He is specifically, of course, referring to the Day of Atonement, when he will atone for the sins of the world and will ultimately be killed. So what he's telling them is, hey, the Jews are trying to kill me and it's not my time to die yet. Remember, if you've looked at my other episodes, you will see one we talked about during Easter. He was supposed to die at a very specific time because all the earth testified, including the constellations in the heavens above, testified that he was to die at that certain place and at that certain time. And it wasn't time yet, so that's why he didn't go up. Verse 7 of John 7, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it, that the works thereof are evil. Think about what, what Jesus is explaining here to his brethren. And it's a good lesson for us as well. Jesus spoke the truth. The truth was is that the people were evil and they needed to repent. How often do you hear a message of repentance? It, it may be that no one's ever told you to repent. But let me be one. If I haven't done so already, I myself am flawed and foolish and I need to repent. You need to repent and turn to your God. Until you hear the words from Christ declaring you that you are his son or you are his daughter and he has begotten you 
until you've heard those words from Christ's own mouth, there is still work to do. And as John says in the New Testament, while you are alive, you stand in jeopardy every hour. You can fall. You can fail. Even King David, who was so great, fell. You can fall too. I can fall too. It is important that every day you observe the rituals of prayer and service and good works and that you check yourself and you watch your pride and repent. Remember, repentance really means to turn and face the Lord. Whatever it is you're facing in life, turn and face the Lord and he will walk with you. He will help you. He will forgive you of your sins. Come and walk with him. And that's what he was telling them. Stop the junk, the garbage you're doing, and and repent of your evil works and come unto God. And because he did that, they hated him. Don't have a hard heart and hate me and hate others. Instead, accept the, re- the call to repentance. Change the things that you're doing wrong in your life and come to Christ. All of us are needed, in need of repentance. All right, verse 8 of John chapter 7 Go ye up unto this feast. I go not up yet unto this feast, for my time is not yet full come. So again, Christ is telling him, you go up, I'm going to come up later, right? That's what he says. I go not up yet unto this feast. So he's telling him, I'm going to come later, but you go now, right? Because my time isn't come. I don't want to get killed. It's not the right time. Verse 9, when he had said these words unto them, he abode still in Galilee. So he still hung out in Galilee. Okay, so that's the first the first section there. The next section um, I would read would be 10 through 13, sorry, 10 through 12. Let's read these. But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up unto the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, where is he? So we have his brethren going up to the feast and the Jews inquiring of his brethren, where is he? Where is he? And he, Christ, is coming up in secret. He's coming up in a different route, in a different way, so that they don't know he's there. Verse 12, and there was much murmuring among the people concerning him. For some said, he is a good man. Others said, nay, but he deceiveth the people. I want you to see and notice what's going on here in verse 12. You have murmuring. Um, Murmuring, this corresponds with, you know, what Laman and Lemuel were doing with Sam and Nephi. They were murmuring. And murmuring has a couple other translations, and I'd invite you to go look those up to see what that word could possibly mean. But look at what they're saying. Some people are saying, he's a good man. And then others here say, he deceives the people. There is some contention. There is some discussion. There is a debate going on about Jesus. That debate still rages today. There are some who say he was a good man, and others who say he deceives. You need to decide what you think of Christ. And if you think he's a good man, and you think he was a prophet, and you think he was more than a prophet, even the Son of God, then you ought to follow in his ways. Because you cannot get to where he is unless you do. So make the changes. That goes back to repentance. But I want you to I want you to remember that there is now a division among the people. Some say he's good, some say he's a deceiver. This also corresponds with the words that Joseph explained in Joseph Smith History, chapter 1, verse 10. I'll let you look that one up as well. All right, let's keep going on. Verse 13 of John, chapter 7. Howbeit no man spake openly of him for fear of the Jews. Wow, imagine that for a moment. These conversations where someone was saying, he's a good man, and someone else was saying, he deceiveth the people. They did not speak openly about Jesus because they feared the Jews. They feared the religious hierarchy. There was such control there that if they spoke openly, they would probably have been disciplined, perhaps excommunicated, perhaps thrown out because they spoke of him. They were afraid. Don't be fearful. Have courage. You can speak about Christ. Don't fear men. Instead, fear God. There's a great passage here in, um, we're going to jump to it, Acts 5. And um, as I turn to it, um, what happened after Jesus was died and resurrected is his disciples went about preaching and Peter and the others 
were instructed specifically by Caiaphas, the, the Jewish high priest, not to preach Jesus, not to talk about him. And when they did, um, they called them in, and this is um, uh, verse 28 of Acts 5. It says, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in his name? In other words, they're reprimanding the apostles for teaching in the name of Jesus. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. See, shame on you is what he's saying. And verse 29, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. And I would hope that you would take this on as your mantra. You know, anyone can say, don't pray, don't read your scriptures, don't follow Christ. And they are men or they're women. Don't listen to them. You listen to your heart, listen to your soul, and listen to God speaking to you who is openly telling you to follow him. Don't be afraid. We ought to follow God rather than men. You follow God rather than men. Another reference for you to look up on that is Hebrews 5, chapter 9, as well as 2 Nephi uh, 28, verse 31. Um, don't have fear of the Jews. Don't have fear of anyone. Go and do what God would have you do. All right, let's keep going on. Verse 14. Now, about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. So now we're here in the midst of the feast probably right in the middle of it, because the mist usually means in the middle. And Jesus goes up to the temple and he starts teaching. Okay, so at the beginning he didn't come because they were going to kill him. He waited a little bit, he came up in secret, and now he's going to teach in the temple. Verse 15, And the Jews marveled, saying, How knoweth this man letters, having never learned? The Jews marveled, the people marveled, not just the the, the commoners, those who are, who are available to go into the entire uh, court in the temple. But even the leaders of the Jews marveled. When was the last time you marveled at the gospel? I just want to suggest that if you haven't, if, if church is getting boring to you, or if your scripture study is getting boring, you're doing something wrong. This ought to be exciting. It ought to motivate you to love others, to love God. If your scripture study is bringing you or your gospel study is bringing you into, into a place of negativity, you're doing something wrong because this is supposed to be alive in you. And it is supposed to make you sing praises and sing hosannas to God for what he has done for you, redeeming you from the fall. So if you're not marveling, there's something wrong. Look about you. Reconnect with nature. Spend some more time in prayer. Stop focusing on the garbage and focus on that which is light and truth. And if you do that, you'll find yourself marveling as the Jews were. All right. And they're basically saying they're marveling because they're thinking and they said, how is it that you can teach us? You've never learned, meaning you didn't get your knowledge from our theological schools. You didn't study to be a priest. You're a carpenter, or as some would say, a brick mason, depending on what what, what accounts you believe. But anyway, you're a manual laborer. What can you do to teach us? You're, you didn't go to theological seminary. You're not a priest. You're not a rabbi. Verse 16 of John chapter 7. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Think about, think about how Christ has his authority. In verse 15, they are saying essentially, you don't have any credentials. You don't have any authority. You didn't come through the proper channels. You are not the high priest. You're not Annas. You're not Caiaphas. You're not a member of the Sanhedrin. You're not a scribe. You're not a Pharisee. So you are not in authority here, right? You're not in the proper channels. And we have Christ telling them, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Where does authority of God come from? Authority from God comes from God. And in this case, it's directly from God. It didn't come passing down. There was no line of authority. If there was a line of authority, it was one. God to Jesus. He got, Jesus got authority directly from God. And what he's preaching, his doctrine isn't Jesus's. It's our Heavenly Father's. It's his that sent him. You see, this is one of the ways you can tell a false messenger from a true messenger. A false messenger will teach you something and 
Well, if it's priestcraft, they'll charge you money. They'll say, pay me, give me money. I want your money. That's that's a, one of the signs of a false messenger. The other one is that they want to glorify themselves and set themselves up as a light to others saying, look at me, I'm so wonderful and great. That's a, that's a sign of a false messenger. Look at how Christ was a true messenger saying, my doctrine is not mine but his that sent me. Christ didn't, wouldn't even accept the compliment of being good. He reflected that on the Father. You do the same. Don't go around saying, strutting your stuff, saying how great I am, look at my marvelous works. Everything that we do as humans on this earth will suck in comparison to what God does. His work is much better, much greater, much holier than anything that we can do here and now. And I've referenced uh, Mother Teresa before, but if you look at her works, if you look at her biography, what you will find is, uh, if you study it, she was an amazing woman who touched the lives of thousands of people. She gave truly of herself, and you read it, and it is remarkable. And you realize that she was living a holy life, yet even her work pales in comparison to what Christ did and what our Heavenly Father has done. So his doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Verse 17 of John 7. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. This is the test. Um, this is the test of how you, me, or any of us can know whether Christ's doctrine is true or not. You have to do his will. If you do his will, then you know if the doctrine is true or not, if it's of God. This does not appear to be um, just something that you can choose to do here and now, but you actually have to experience it. Let me give you an example. Oftentimes in, in our culture, in our society, we think that to learn something is to study about it. That doesn't mean that you know it because you know it intellectually. To know and not to do is not to know. I want to say that again so it goes deep inside you because this is profound. Perhaps even write it down. If you know something and you don't do it, you don't actually know it. Because in order to live, the gospel is not to be understood intellectually. It's to be understood in the living of it. You can't know the truth of the gospel until you've bent your knee and served another. You are informed by the experience. If you don't have the experience, you don't get the knowledge. And it is through knowledge that you are saved. Not intellectual knowledge, but experiential knowledge. And that is why the gospel is meant to be lived. Because I can tell you how great and wonderful it is, but it will mean nothing to you unless you live it. Once you live it, you will know that it's true. Why? Because it will resonate with your soul. It will gratify your inside heart. You will know that it's true because you will live it and you will realize that this is good. It will taste delicious to you. Because what you'll realize if you follow another path is that of pride, arrogance, and thinking yourself wonderful and better than others will only lead to a deterioration of your soul where you will become bitter and you will become hateful and it'll go downhill from there. So keep in mind that this is so profound that this is one of those, uh, used to be a scripture mastery. I know they've changed that over the years, but you could also look here at a couple other references, John 8, verses 32 through 33 and John 18, 37. This is also a test to see who will follow the Lord and who will not follow the Lord. You know, just because you know that a, God, a doctrine is true, if you don't live it, it means you don't know it. And let me explain this one other way. When Zion is established, yes, we know Zion are, are the pure in heart. Zion is also a city that is to be built in the future. When Zion is established, just because you know it exists doesn't mean you are qualified to live there because living there will require a certain behavior. You can say, um, I believe in paying tithing, but yet if you don't ever pay it, you don't earn, your experience is never 
informed by that that action. You can always say, I believe in giving service to other, helping the poor and needy. But if you actually don't ever help the poor and needy, then you don't actually know because you haven't lived it. All right, let's keep moving on. Verse 18, he that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory, but he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. You see, catch what Jesus is preaching. He's preaching everything that the Father sent him to preach. He's not seeking his own glory. He was so good at this that he taught in the Last Supper that we'll get to eventually, that you must kneel and wash the feet, the most menial task he did because he who is the least will be the greatest. And Christ was the greatest because he descended below them all. And that's what he's teaching us here. Don't seek your own glory. Don't seek to gratify your pride. Don't seek to gratify your ambition. Instead, do what he sent you to do. Glorify the Father. If somebody wants to praise you, just reflect that back up to the Father. And don't be afraid to say, I am not good, but he is good. No, There's no unrighteousness in our Lord nor in our Heavenly Father. Verse 19 of John chapter 7. Did not Moses give you the law? And yet none of you keepeth the law. Why go ye about to kill me? You see, he is specifically talking about following the law. What law? Thou shalt not kill. That's found in Exodus chapter 20, one of the Ten Commandments. And so he was able to discern their thoughts, their hearts, and he said, why do you go about to kill me? So this is the second time. The first time it was talked about killing him was all the way back in John 7, chapter 1. Remember it said the Jews sought to kill him. Here we have it again. Why do ye go about to kill me? He's actually questioning them. Verse 20 of John chapter 7, the people answered and said, thou hast a devil who goeth about to kill thee. So the first thing they do is they try to justify their actions. Um, they say, thou hast a devil. Okay, um, If you have a devil, then you can be killed, right? So they first accuse, but then the next, in the next breath, they said, who goeth about to kill thee? Um, because they didn't talk about it openly trying to kill the Lord. It was more in their hearts. So who, who told you this? How did you find out this information? Jesus, in chapter uh, 7 of John, uh, verse 21, Jesus answered and said unto them, I have done word work, and ye all marvel. Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because of it, not because it is of Moses, but of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. If a man on the Sabbath day receive circumcision, that the law of Moses should not be broken, are ye angry at me because I have made an a man every whit whole on the Sabbath day. So what he's doing is, remember, they were they were upset. And what John is referring us to is uh, earlier in the Gospel of John where he went to the pool of Bethsaida and there healed a man on the Sabbath day. And this is what he's specifically referring to because they said he sinned by healing that man on the Sabbath. And what Jesus is pointing out is, hey, wait a minute, you've got this law it's the law of circumcision, and it's done on the eighth day after a male child is born. And even if it falls on the Sabbath day, you will perform that ritual circumcision. That's how important it is to you. And doing that act on the Sabbath is work, and it breaks the law of Moses. Yet you do it anyway, and you have an exception for it. Why is that? Because I didn't even just follow a ritual ordinance. I actually made a man whole every whit. That's what Jesus is saying to them. And then on verse 24, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. You see, it's given unto all of us to judge, right? And what did Christ teach us in the Sermon on the Mount? Go back and look at it. He taught us, judge not that ye be not judged. And so here he's teaching them, don't judge on appearance. You don't judge a book by its cover. Make a righteous decision. Don't judge at all. And if you're going to judge, judge a righteous judgment. Verse 25, then said some of them. So again, remember, there's different factions. There's different sections here. Some that believe, some think that he's a good man, some think that he's a deceiver. So here, verse 25, then said some of them of Jerusalem, is not this he whom they seek to kill? You see, there is rumors going around. It's not just something in their hearts. 
the third time we're told that they were seeking to kill him. Verse 26 of John 7, But lo, he speaketh boldly, and they say nothing unto him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is the very Christ? So here you have some of them saying that don't the rulers realize that this is the Christ? This is the very Christ? And also, notice what they said. He speaketh boldly. Christ was not timid. He was not afraid of men. He did what he had to do. He came and he fulfilled his mission. You do the same. You be brave. You be bold. Don't be timid. You be like your Lord. When, when uh, fear comes, cast it aside. Decide now to be brave and to have courage. Do what the God would have you do. Don't fear men. Fear God instead. Verse 27. Howbeit we know this man whence he is, but when Christ cometh, no man knoweth whence he is. See, there's some who said, we know where he came from. Uh, he came from Bethlehem. He came from Egypt. He came from Nazareth. He came from Galilee, right? He came from all these different places, depending on which version you're reading or where, what city he actually came out from where he was dwelling, right? We don't know where Christ is going to come from, but we know where he's from, so therefore he can't be the Christ. Mm, not quite right reasoning. Let's see, verse 28. Then cried Jesus in the temple as he taught them, saying, Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am, and I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom ye know not. Now, this is not all of what Christ said in this, in this section, but this is just 28. Think about the words that Christ is using. What is he declaring to them? Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. He's not talking about the things of this world. Remember, Christ's kingdom is not of this world. It's of a different, of a better world. Ye both know me, and ye know whence I am. So when he said, whence I am, he is saying, I am Jehovah, the great I am, one of the names of God. He's declaring to them that he is God. And he comes not of himself. Remember, he was sent from his Father, our Heavenly Father. He is a true messenger. He that sent me is true, whom ye know not. In other words, our Heavenly Father sent me, and you don't know him. You profess to know him, but you don't know him. You don't know him. And that also reckons to the intercessory prayer, John 17, 3, where he prayed that all might know him. All right, let's keep going on. John 7, verse 29. But I know him, for I am from him, and he hath sent me. So again, we have a testimony from Jesus that he is a messenger sent from God to teach them, and that he knows our Heavenly Father. I am from him. We've talked before in uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 88, I believe it's verses 7 through 13, where it talks about the light of Christ being in, through, and around all things. He is in you. He is in me. He is in the sun. He's in the moon. He's in the stars. He's in the earth. He's in all things, and he sustains us from moment to moment. So when he says, I am from him, think about that imagery, not just I am God or I am Jehovah, or another name of God, but God is in me. God's also in you, and he's powering all of us. All right, verse 30. Then sought they, or then they sought to take him. Okay, so immediately here, they consider this blasphemy, and they want to take him. They're going to remove him, right? With what purpose? Well, the purpose to kill him, as we've looked three times already, right? But, verse 30 of John chapter 7, but no man laid hands on him, because his hour was not yet come. So think about what's going on here after Jesus boldly testified to them as they tried to kill him, but no one laid a hand on him because it was not the right time. He was able to evade, slip away. There's a passage in John, where, or not John, in Luke. I believe it's Luke 4. You look it up. It's where he declares himself in the synagogue and all the people try and throw him off the cliff and he magically disappears. Well, this is a similar type of thing where Christ, remember, um, he has the ability and control over the elements. He can uh, disappear, as it were, go invisible, get lost in a crowd, make it so your eyes are holden so you cannot see him. He can make it so you don't recognize him. 
And that's exactly what he did. All right, let's keep going. Uh, Verse 31, and many of the people believed on him and said, when Christ cometh, will he do more miracles than these which this man hath done? So here you have a testimony of many people. Remember, there's different sections, different factions, different groups. Here are many people who believed on him. And her words were, when Christ comes, will he do more miracles than these? Well, obviously not, because this is the Christ. Um, Some references also to look at here, um, Exodus uh, chapter 8, verse 19, and Luke 11, 20. All right, and let's keep going on. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard that the people murmured such things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. So here, they're not going to do this themselves. They're going to send officers and other people to do this work for them um, because of the murmurings. Remember, this this harkens back to the prior verse where it talked about there were murmurings from him. That's uh, verse 12 of John 7. All right, let's keep going. John 7, 33. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while while I am with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. So what Christ's doing is he's beginning to prepare them for what is going to come. See, he's not going to be here forever. He's got a mission. It's going to last three years, and then he's going to leave, and he's going to come back for about 40 days and minister, and then he's going to go visit his other sheep, Um that they didn't ever inquire inquire about. So um, I'm going to go to him and to him that sent me, meaning I'm going to report back to my heavenly father. All right, let's look at verse 34. This is a good verse. Ye shall seek me and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. What is he talking about here? Ye shall seek me. You know, uh, there's that saying that wise men still seek him today, which is which is true. And there's also a saying that um, that uh, those who are noble, those who are virtuous, um, will seek after the Lord. It's also true that once you realize who he is, that you will seek him. But it says here that you shall not find me. If you seek him, you shall not find me. Why is that? Why is it that you won't find him when you t- turn to seek him? It's because when it finally dawns on you who he is, he's not going to be right in your presence. Um, where I am, thither you cannot come. He's specifically talking to those who did not believe. Where is he talking about? Now, when they, re- when they heard these words, they thought he was talking about a physical location here on earth. Oh, he's going to go to some far off land, or he's going to go to another city or a town where, where we can't get to, Right? That's what they thought he meant. But what he was talking about was something else. He's talking about entering into another world, the spiritual world. Um, He's talking about ascending up to our Heavenly Father. And they, because they did not live the gospel nor believe it, they couldn't go there. You see, you have to live it, not just believe it. It requires action. Uh, Some other verses for you to look at um, that we don't have time to get to now, but get these in your study. Doctrine and Covenants, section 76, 112. DNC 2515, um, power to go where? That's the question. Ask yourself where that is. What kingdom is he talking about? Kingdom not of this world. All right, let's keep going. John 7, verse 35. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? You see, that's what they thought. He's going to go far away. Um, on this Verse here, you should look up Isaiah 49, uh, 6, also Psalms 147, 2. Um, yeah, they were they didn't understand. All right, verse 36 of chapter 7 of John. What manner of saying is this, that he said, ye shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am, ye, sh- ye thither ye cannot come. You see, what they're doing is they're repeating his words, trying to figure out, they're studying it, because it went right over their heads. Whew. Don't let it go over your head. Don't be like the scribes and Pharisees. Be like your Lord. Verse 37, In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. So think about this. Now we got some more context. We have the last day. We have the last day of the feast. 
on the last day of the feast, they would read some scriptures. Um, I'm pulling this out of the uh, Jewish New Testament uh, commentary. I've uh, referred to this previously. Uh, this is on page uh, 178. The last day of the Feast of the Tabernacles is called Roshana Rava and literally means on the last day, the great day of the festival. Um, so the seventh day of Sukkot was its climax. Throughout the seven days of the festival, a special Kohen had carried water in a golden pitcher from the pool of Shiloh to be poured into a basin at the foot of the altar by the Kohen Haggadah. It symbolized prayer for rain, which begins the next day. And it also pointed towards outpouring of the Rosh HaKodesh on the people of Israel. The rabbis associated this custom with Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. They also waved branches and read or sang Psalms chapters 113 through 1, um, 118. So if you look at Psalms 113 all the way to 118, they would read or sing these at the altar as this uh, ceremony was going on. They would also blow golden trumpets. I'm going to read Psalms 118, uh, verses 25 through 27. Adonai, please save us. Adonai, please prosper us. Blessed is he who cometh in the name of Adonai. We have blessed you out of the house of Adonai. God is Adonai. He hath given us light. Um, they also say, please save us, right? Hosanna Rava, great Hosanna, or a Hosanna shout. That's what's going on during the last day of the Feast of the Tabernacle. And during this is when Jesus stood and cried. If he's crying, ask yourself how loud would his voice be as he delivers this message. If any man thirst, remember man isn't talking just male. It's male and female. In the Hebrew, um, I, I've mentioned this before, um, we're talking about mankind. Whenever you see any group of people, if there's just one man, even if there's a hundred women and just one man, in Hebrew, that word is masculine. So when you see any man, it's referring to mankind, which includes women. So this message isn't just to men, but it's to women also. And it, the message is to you. If you thirst, you come unto Christ and drink. Is he talking about water? No, he's not talking about water. He's talking about spiritual water. And he says, if you believe on him, if you believe on Jesus Christ, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. What does this verse mean? Out of whose belly? Is he saying Christ's belly or out of your belly? That's one to study. That's a great question for your class. You think about that. You ponder it. Um, I also want to bring you back to verses 35 through 36. Um, and I have a little note here I want to share with you. It says, the Jews had lost the ancient beliefs in the ascension to heaven. And so when he's talking about where, you, where I'm going, you can't come, he's talking specifically about an ascension to heaven. And this is kind of an aside. If you want to go down this road and you have some time, write these scriptures down. John 6, 41 through 42, John 8, 22, and teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page uh, 347. So uh, if you believe on Christ, as the scriptures has said, out of your belly or out of Christ's belly shall flow living waters. There's this idea um, that here on earth, immortality, while we are alive, we need constant uh, food. We need constant water. Most people eat three or more meals a day. Um, if you don't have water within three days, you die. If you don't have food within a certain amount of time, you die. You need constant nourishment to your body. You also need to have living water or living spiritual water in you. How do you get spiritual water? That's a great question. Um, also look at John uh, 15, 26, John 19, 30, John 20, 22, John 14, verses 18 through 23 as you engage in some more study. All right, um, verse 39, but this spake he out of... He, this. I'll start over. Verse 39 of John 7, But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So there's some translation errors in here. 
um, so look at the Joseph Smith translation, but it's not talking about the Holy Ghost had not yet been given. He's talking about specifically like the um, day of Pentecost when everything's coming down all at once, uh, an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. That doesn't mean the Spirit of God wasn't on the earth because, of course, it was. Um, and he spake it of the Spirit. The Spirit was already there. All right, verse 40. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, of a truth, this is a prophet. So again, you see the factions. Of a truth, this is a prophet. They recognized the spirit. They felt it in their soul. It resonated with them. Verse 41, others said, this is the Christ. But some said, shall Christ come out of Galilee? So you have those who are convinced this is the Christ. And then you have others who, they're just not so sure. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Well, we shall see, right? Verse 42, Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? And if you study the other gospels, of course, you already know that Christ came out of Bethlehem and he was a descendant of David. That's why at the beginning of Matthew, beginning of Luke, you see those genealogies set forth. Verse 43, so there was a division among the people because of him. And this will always be the case. This will always be the case when you see someone sent from God. There will always be someone rising up in opposition to them. In fact, um, sheesh, I wonder if I still have it here. Um, yeah, I think so. If uh, This is one of the teachings of uh, Joseph Smith. This is from uh, History of the Church, Volume 6, verse um, or page 364. Uh, in relation to the kingdom of God, the devil always sets up his kingdom at the very same time in opposition to God. That's Joseph Smith. So the devil always sets up his kingdom at the very time in opposition to God. Why is that? Well, because there must needs be opposition in all things. Um, that is uh, 2 Nephi chapter 2, verse 11. For it must needs be that there is an opposition in all things. If not so, my firstborn in the wilderness, righteousness could not be brought to pass, neither wickedness, neither holiness nor misery, neither good nor bad. Wherefore, all things must needs be a compound and one. Wherefore, if it should be one body, it must needs remain as dead, having no life, neither death nor corruption nor incorruption, happiness nor misery, neither sense nor insensibility." Think about that. We have to have opposition. You have to have the temptation. And seeing good and seeing evil, you have to look between them and then you have to choose on your own good from evil. If you choose evil, there's a consequence. If you choose good, there's a consequence. But it's given unto you to choose. You are free. And you can learn from your own experience good from evil. And through that experience, after having tasted that bitter evil, you can then turn from it and choose good instead. And Christ, if you turn to him and you repent, he'll forgive you of anything and all that garbage, the sins you've committed, he'll wash them, will make them white as snow. And you can move on in a holier, better fashion than you did before. There has to be 10,000 voices telling you something opposite of what is true so that you can choose for yourself that which is good. You see, when I share these things and I believe them to be true, you have to decide whether they are or not. It's, it's not up to me. Once I deliver the message, I'm done. But it's up to you to decide whether you're going to live it or not. It's not up to me. But you'll always see this. There will always be somebody out there. All right, so let's keep going on here. Um, we're looking at uh, John chapter 7. Uh, we're looking at verse 44. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. So again, we have people who are ready to take action, but his time was not yet come, and no one would lay hands on him. Verse 45. Then came the officers at the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto him, Why have ye not brought him? Why haven't you brought him? You see, they wanted to get him, but they didn't. That happened twice. Why? Why haven't you brought him? And the officers answered, this is verse 46 of John chapter 7, Never man spake like this, man. Think about that. 
he was able to pierce their soul with his words because never man spake like this man. They sensed in him something that they didn't see in anyone else. Verse uh, 47, Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Their own officers who they sent to get Jesus was convinced by his words that they better not lay hands on him. And the Jewish priests, the Pharisees said, Are ye also deceived? Are ye also deceived? Don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Believe in Christ. Don't be like these Pharisees who want to kill somebody. Get anger and hate your heart and put in there instead love. All right, verse 48. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? In other words, they're challenging him saying, we who are the religious authorities, we don't believe on him. So you shouldn't either. Appeal to my authority. That's not the way to win. You don't just say, I'm great and wonderful, or I know so much, or I'm in charge, therefore believe me. Have something else behind your message besides I'm an authority. Anyway, moving on. Verse 49, but this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Basically saying you guys are ignorance, be, ignorant because you've not studied in our theological seminaries and you're not in a position of authority like we are. You've been deceived because and you're cursed, right? That's not really the way it works because God is no respecter of persons and it doesn't matter how educated you are. He goes after your heart. Look at Alma chapter 12 verses 9 through 11 again and you'll see that what he's after is your heart. That's why he has to have a broken heart and a contrite spirit to allow him to enter in. All right, let's keep going on. Uh, verse 50, Nicodemus saith unto them, he that came to Jesus by night being one of them. Now remember, Nicodemus is a rabbi. Uh, he is a member of the Pharisees. And in John 3, he's the one who came to Christ at night asking him about baptism and being born again um, and calling him an enlightened heavenly guide. Rabbi. So you got the, this one of the members of the Pharisees talking to Jesus, calling him rabbi. Something to consider. And here we have him back in his position here with the Pharisees. And he said unto them, verse 51, Doth our law judge any man before it heareth, hear him and know what he doeth? Nicodemus was very wise. He's not trying to create problems, but he's also trying to save the Lord because he recognized in him something true, something holy. He knew that he was sent from God. So he brings up simply the law. The law. Does our law allow us to judge someone without him being heard and without knowing what he does? He's invoking these laws, the law of Moses, so that they don't send the officers out again to get him and to kill him. Verse 52, they, being the other uh, Pharisees, answered and said unto him, unto Nicodemus, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. So basically saying, hey, is he a countryman of yours? Are you from Galilee? Is that why you're saying this? Because out of Galilee, look it up, look at the, check it out, research. No prophets coming out of Galilee. But remember, Christ came from many different places. He came from Bethlehem, Egypt, Nazareth, Galilee. He just stayed there for a little while. Verse 53, and every man went unto his own house. You see, now the debate's over. It's a stalemate, and everybody's going back to his house. And that is how chapter 7 of John concludes. So there are some nuggets of wisdom. There is some truth and light in there. And we are going to hopefully pick it up, and I'll be able to do 8, 9, 10, and 11 at some other time. But this is going to be the conclusion of this episode. If you have any questions, please uh, put the question in the comment box below, and I'd be happy to answer it. If you've liked this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you've disliked this video for whatever reason, hit that dislike button twice. Thanks for watching.